let's, uh, let's pray and then we're going to dive in. We've got a lot to cover tonight, and so I want to make sure we get to it all. Uh, a lot of people that are going in for tests here soon, and, and we want to make sure we're, we're praying for healing in, in those individuals. Uh, and then just continue to pray for, for us as a church that we're, we're doing what God wants us to do. So let's pray and then we'll kind of get into it. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here and to, to dive into your word and to, to see the things that you want us to see and understand the things you want us to understand. God, as always, our prayer is this, that we, we will not leave here the same as when we walked in, that we will uh, be so moved by your word and by the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place this, the, tonight that we, 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 we cannot walk out of here the same and that we would be moved to better fulfill the things that you have called us to do with 100% assurance of our salvation and 100% just motivation to grow the kingdom of God. And we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of that. And we praise you for the opportunity to, to dive into your word tonight. And we, we pray that it will honor you in the way that we do that. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so turn to Revelation chapter 8. We're going to get started. And um, I'll go ahead and review just a little bit like I always do and trying to, uh, to, to make sure that we're, you know, when, when new people walk in, they at least kind of have an idea where we're coming from. We're, we've been studying Revelation. This is week 15 in our, 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 our walk through Revelation. I looked at it today, and I'm thinking it's probably going to take us about 35 weeks to walk through all of Revelation, which puts us at about the middle of October. So I hope you're in for the long haul. And then what I'm thinking about doing after that's over, just so you all know, I'm thinking about doing a study on angels, um, it just kind of a, uh, a three or four week study on angels that I think will be pretty interesting. So I'll let you know if, they, if I uh, follow through with that anytime soon. Um, so we're in, in Revelation chapter 8 uh, and, and our timeline, we've come out of the church age. Remember the church age of, in Revelation is chapters 1 through 3. Uh, that, is the, uh, that is the period that we're in right now. And that's the period that has, is still going. So in, in when, when, when John has is, is been told to write down the things that were, the things that are, we're in the things that are part. And then he's going to, then he's, that's where we are currently. Where we currently are in, in Revelation 8 are in the things that are to come. And so what's happened here, we get into uh, past chapters one, and th- 1 through 3, we get into chapters 4 and 5, and that is the rapture of the church. Remember, the rapture of the church comes from that word snatch. That's the moment that Jesus, the, the, heaven, the door to heaven is going to open up. Jesus is going to come, and we're going to meet him in the sky as the rapture for all those who are believers. And that's when the rapture is going to take place. And so all those who are believers in Christ uh, and have that relationship with him will be snatched out, and they will be a part of the rapture that's taking place in which John starts to write in chapters 4 and 5 about being in the throne room of God, uh, the, the incredible colors that are there, the, uh, all the different multitudes of people, the sea of glass, the 24 elders representing the, com- the completeness of the church, and then the four living beasts or angels. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. Uh, and so we see that, we, we kind of go through that, and then after the throne room of, after John in the throne room of God in, 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 in chapters 4 and 5, John then turns his attention to what's taking place on the earth because that's when the tribulation starts in, in chapter 6. In chapter 6, we see the, uh, the, the seals begin to get broken. At the end of chapter 5, we know that Jesus, the Lamb, is the only one who is worthy to break the seals. Uh, and he, he begins in chapter 6 by breaking the first seal. And we know that those, four, those, those first six seals are the white horse, which was, we discovered was the Antichrist. Uh, the second seal was the red horse, which is uh, symbolic of war and all that will take place on the earth during that time. The third seal is the black horse, uh, which will represent famine and ac- economic collapse and all that will go along with that. The, the uh, fourth seal is the pale horse. Remember, that comes from that word chloro, uh, where we get our word chlorophyll from. So we're not talking about a pale horse like a pale white horse. We're talking about a pale green horse um, like we, you get when you're sick. Uh, and that's going to be the death of many unbelievers when that when that horse when that seal is broken, the uh, the the breaking of the fifth seal will be representative of the uh, the death of some believers during that tribulation. Remember, uh, all believers at the at the tribu- at the uh, at the rapture will be called out, but there will be those who are saved during that tribulation period, and this is what they're talking about in those in that particular instance. And then seal number six, when it's broken, is representative of all, all the natural 
uh, disasters, tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanoes and all that that will take place. And so then we got we looked at chapter seven last week, and chapter seven is this. It's almost this interlude. It's almost a, a chapter that's that's kind of out of place. It's not in chronological order, and it's almost like this break we get because after all these six seals have have been broken, and all this devastation takes place on the earth, over a billion people, according to the numbers that were given. Uh, will be lost, their, their lives will be lost during that time period. It, it'll, be a, it'll be a horrible, horrible time on earth. And remember, this tribulation is, is lasting for seven years, and they're just getting started, just getting started. And so in chapter 7, we, we seem to get this break of, a, of, of a, a vision behind the scenes that John is getting to see where the, the four angels are holding back the winds that are coming to uh, bring devastation on the earth. And we get this we get this beautiful picture and i think it's important that we understand this because of what it leads us into in chapter 8 this beautiful picture of worship that's taking place the church is john sees the uh, the multitudes and when he says multitudes it's, it's just too many people to count it's just too many people all all the angels it's not some of the angels it's every single angel in this in this vision that he sees and it's the multitudes that he sees there and they're and they're surrounding the 24 elders and the 24 elders are surrounding the four living beasts or the four living angels that are that are worshiping at the at the at, at the throne and, and there sits the lamb in the middle of this this uh of this throne room and it's this bi- beautiful picture of what worship is going to look like and you've got to imagine it's an incredible worship scene but it's this pause that we get between the sixth seal being broken and the seventh seal being broken. And when we get into chapter 8 tonight, we get into that seventh seal being broken. Now, the seventh seal, as it's broken, it is essentially the announcement of the next series of events that are going to take place. And these come in the form of the seven trumpets that we're going to, look, we're going to start looking at tonight. And when we get to the seventh trumpet, it will be basically be an announcement of the next set of, series of events that will come into play, and that will be the bowls that are poured out. And again, each one of these series of events gets progressively worse. And when it get, as it gets progressively worse, um, that's, that's why they call it the, the tribulation versus the great tribulation. Uh, from chapter 6 up to chapter 11 of Revelation in verse 14, that is where most people believe the first three and a half years of the tribulation ends in chapter 11 verse 14 and in chapter 11 verse 15 is where they believe the second half of the seven-year tribulation begins and that is what they call the great tribulation again because everything is getting progressively worse as it is announced as those seals are broken as those trumpets are blown and those bowls are poured out and so we we get into that and that's that's kind of where we are tonight and so i'm going to take i'm going to go ahead and read this all to you it's not a long chapter tonight Uh, But there's a lot to unpack in it. So let's take a look at it. And then we'll kind of go through it verse by verse. Verse uh, verse 1, chapter 8 says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about an hour, a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints. On the golden altar before the throne, the smoke, of, the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels, who had the seven trumpets, prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a, th- from the sky on a third of the rivers and of the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, 
a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned back. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in, in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. And so let's go back to chapter, or chapter 8, verse 1, and let's start right there, and let's begin to figure out what we're looking at. So with the, uh, with the opening of the seventh seal, the pronouncement of the, the next series of events is, is, is announced, and that's what happens. When, the, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And so this silence in heaven may point to a couple of different things. First of all, it's this dramatic pause that's taking place. Remember what we just said about chapter 6 and what was taking place in there, or chapter 7, what was taking place in there. Just this, John had just experienced, he had just seen a worship service that would have been absolutely unmatched. Think of the best worship concert that you've ever been to. Think of, think of the, 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 the whatever, whatever concert, whatever singer it was that you ever went to and you walked away and said, that's, that's, the, greatest, that's the greatest time of worship I've ever had. Maybe it was a, a, a day in church. Maybe it was a concert, something you saw. But you just walked away. It was just unmatched. He, he witnessed multitudes, too large to count, all of them praising God. He saw the promised, uh, the, the lamb, the promise of the lamb being their shepherd and God wiping away every tear. We see that at the end of, of chapter 7. Read right there in verse 17 of chapter, uh, chapter 7. It says, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of, of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Just this beautiful moment of worship, this pause that's taking place between this, this destruction of the first six seals and what's about to happen when the seventh seal takes place. And then... As all of that is happening, this incredible worship service starts. The breaking of the seventh seal, however it's done, however it's unrolled, however it's done, is, is, is broken. And this hush just falls over the multitudes. The worship service has come to an end. Because they know, they know that God is not yet finished. And the next event is about to take place. That's... That's, that's one of the reasons that, that, this, this, that this pause is so important, this silence in heaven. It's this dramatic pause. Now, another, another thing that it might be here is it may be the expectation of the prayers of the saints about to go to God. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit more if we get a little bit further along in this, in this study. But the idea is that the prayers of the saints are offered um, as a sacrifice to God, and heaven understands the beauty of this event. Right? And again, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but, but think about it this way. Not only does the singing and worshiping cease, but so does the thunder and every other noise that is taking place during this time so that God might hear even the whispered prayers of his people. It's this, this hush because we, we see coming into this next place that these prayers are going to be going up uh, to the people. And so... John moves from, from this, this, this moment of about half an hour of, of, of just silence and this, this dramatic pause or this reverence of what's about to take place. And he, he moves into verse 2 and he says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, the seven angels with the seven trumpets, John is seen out of the multitude of worshipers, these seven angels kind of rise up and take their place. Of, of all the people that were there, you've got to imagine... Have you ever just looked up into a crowd and a sea of people and you, you see everybody, but you see nobody? Does that make sense? And then out of this, this sea of nobody comes these seven angels that begin to kind of take their place and they're, they're kind of put on display and, and they, they, they take their place and they're given these seven trumpets to sound. And uh, these, these seven trumpets are, it's important for us to understand something. They are... Um, there's a close association in the Old Testament and the New Testament where they are always associated with the intervention of God into history. So let's just kind of walk through some of these real quick. I want to mark my place here and I want to show you this. As we see, every time that we see a trumpet blown, uh, it's just kind of marking that, that moment where God has intervened into earthly history 
and shown us some things. First, you would see it in um, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16. I'm going to read all of this to you, starting in verse 16. And I'm going to read through the end of uh, verse 19. Just I want you to listen to this. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning. This is when Moses is on, on, on Mount Sinai. With a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it uh, like, like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And watch this. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. And then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. And so there's one place where we see it tw twice there in, in, in Exodus 19. Then you see it when in uh, Isaiah, in chapter 27, verse 13, when all the remnants of God's people, all the exiles of God's people are being called, uh, kind of called back from where they were. And you see this in chapter 27 and in verse 13. And here's what it says. I'll start in verse 12. In that, day, in that day, the Lord will thresh from the flowing of Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt, and you, O Israelites, will be gathered up one by one. And in that day, when they're talking, when it says that day, it's talking about the day of the Lord, right? And it says, in that day, a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain of Jerusalem. So we see this again and again all through the Old Testament. Uh, we see it in Joel chapter 2 and in verse 1. And this is talking about the, uh, on the day of the Lord, the trumpet will be blown and the alarm sounded. So chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, and it is close at hand. And then in Zephaniah, in chapter 1, verse 16, you see it again. And that's the day that the, uh, again, that's, that, that day will be a day that where the trumpet and the alarm sounds. Look, look in chapter 1, verse 16, uh, it says, it says a day, of, a, day of the, of, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. And so, again, it's th this constant uh, call to, to, to be ready and, and kind of to wake up. Then you go over to Ze Zechariah. In Zechariah, you look in chapter 9 and verse 14. Chapter 9, verse 14, here's what it says. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet, and he will march in the storms of the south. And so we see it there as well. And then you get into the New Testament, and Paul starts to talk about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he speaks about it, he's... he's um, He's, he's talking about the day where the, where, 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 where the trumpet blows and the perishable people will become imperishable. And so, again, these are all moments in, in history where God kind of steps in and makes himself known. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 through 53, here's what it says. Uh, let's start, let's actually start in verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with, the Im with, with immortality. So you see Paul talking about it there. You see Paul talking about it again in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, where we see uh, this, this idea of this trumpet uh, of God when Jesus comes again. And so that's in 4.16, and here's what it says. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus himself even says it this way. Uh, well, Matthew speaks of the great trumpet call when the elect will be gathered. And so in chapter 24, verse 31, uh, here's what he says. He says, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So it's this idea that these trumpets are, are significant because of the fact that they, they, they introduce, they, they all signify that God has stepped into history at some point in time and he is changing the course of, of, of earthly history and in human history during that point in time. So now from what we can study about these things, those trumpets can, can mean one of three things or all three things at the same time. 
first of all, the, the, it's, it's just the sound of an alarm. It, the, the alarm, what is the, the alarm is, is, is there to warn us or to wake us up, right? And when we, when we talked the other day, we said there's three reasons why the tribulation is happening. One of, the, one of the reasons why the tribulation is it's God's last attempt to see his creation come to faith in Jesus. He's doing everything he can during this tribulation period to wake people up and to get their attention because there is no, there is no a, another opportunity after this. He's doing everything he can to still, people, still, people, still see people saved. Uh, we also know that one of the other reasons for the tribulation taking place is that God's not done with Israel, right? God, when, when God says he will, will do, do something with Israel in Revelation, he's not talking about the church. We're not, we're not talking about re, replacement theology. That's, that's heresy. When, when, when God says Israel, he means Israel. And so God is still doing work with Israel. And then the third reason was because he needs to finish out his kingdom. Remember that, that what, we, what we saw last night, we said all those people that were worshiping before the Lord, that made up the entirety of the church. That was the completion. What, what John was seeing there was the completion of the church that was, that was saved and worshiping around the throne. And so there are people during the tribulation who will still be saved, who will make up God's kingdom in its completeness when it's all said and done. And so these, these three trumpets, these trumpets can mean that it can be sounding the alarm and warning of danger and, and, and waking the people up from their sleep. That's one reason, that the, one thing that the trumpets can mean. The second thing the trumpets can mean is that it can announce the arrival of royalty and it would be fitting here as God steps into history. Right. So with each one of these, it's, again, it can be it can be one of them. It can be all three at the same time. Uh, and the third one is that it can summon people to battle. It can, it can get, tell people, hey, you need to get ready. Here's what we're about to walk into. And so all three of those things can be true at the same time, or it can be even one of those things. And, and as you study it, as we look at it, uh, you can kind of decide for yourself if, if it, it involves one or two or all three or what it might be. And then we get into verse uh, verses three through five. And it says, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And so let's look at what that means. The, the altar in heaven is mentioned here. We see it in, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. You can flip back over there if you want to real quick. Here's, here's what, it's, what it's talking about. It says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So that's the first time you see it in Revelation. The next time you see it in Revelation is here uh, in, in chapter, th- I'm not in here, but in chapter 7, verse 3. Here's what it says. And he says, do not harm the land or the seeds of the trees. We put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Uh, it's, no, it's not. That's not words. I must have written that down wrong. And then, so go to 9, oh, I'm sorry, 8-3. It should be 8-3, not 7-3. That's why I was reading the wrong thing. 8-3. Another angel who had, had a golden scepter came and stood at the altar. So that's the second time you see it. So forgive me. I'll fix that on my notes so that it will be right next with you, with you all next week. Uh, chapter 9, verse 13. You'll see it again. It says, The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. And then you see it again in chapter 14. And in verse 18. And this is what it says. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and, and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because the grapes are ripe. So you see it mentioned here at several different points in, in Revelation. Now, what we need to know about this altar is this. is that this has to be an altar of incense. And the reason it has to be an altar of incense is because there are no animal sacrifices in heaven. The reason for that is because Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. Christ was the perfect sacrifice. There is no more need for animal sacrifices to continue to take place in heaven. And so we know that this is the altar of incense. Now, we see this altar of incense in a couple of different places in Scripture, and you can find it in the Old Testament. And the first place you can look is, you can write it down, I'll, I'll read it to you, and you can go back and look at it later on. In Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 12. 
I want to read this to you. Uh, I'm actually going to start in, in verse 11 and, and, and kind of read through verse 12. It says, Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. And he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragment incense and take them behind the curtain. So his, it's this idea that this, this, this sacrifice is being made on this altar. But there is this, this incense altar that is different from the, the sacrificial altar. And this is found in the holy temple, um, in the holy place in the temple. The other place where you, we see it described is in Numbers chapter 16 in verse 46. And here's what it says. Then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with the fire from the altar and hurry to the assembly and make atonement for them. So those are the two of the places where we see this, this incense altar that is uh, described for us. Now, through different things that we can study in Scripture, we know that this incense altar, it's made of gold. It's about 18 inches square and about three foot high. At each, at each corner, it had horns in it. And you saw that, uh, in, in, I think, in Revelation 9, kind of described it there. Maybe it was the, the one in, in uh, chapter 14. Uh, it had horns at each of its corners, and it was hollow, and it was covered with pure gold plate. And it had railings around the altar to keep the burning coals from falling off uh, onto the floor anywhere else. Now, the idea here is that these in the temple... Uh, these incense were burned before the first offering of the day and after the last offering of the day. And the reason for that is that it was, it was customarily thought that if we package up these um, offerings, these burnt offerings, with the sweet aroma of the incense, that makes it pleasing to God, right? Right? And so they would burn before the first offering of the day, and they would burn after the last offering of the day. And it would kind of package up all the burnt offerings that they had had during that, that period of time. And so it goes back to this idea that the prayers of, prayers of God's people, the prayers of God's people are a sweet sacrifice to God. And the sweetness of those, of those prayers is then followed by the coals being, being thrown down. But, but think about it this way. Uh, several people, as I was reading about this and, and studying this, said, said it of this. We might not always have something to offer God it's in the way of material things. We might not have something that we can sacrifice to him. But one thing that we can always sacrifice to God is our prayers. And we can always lift those up to him. And we know from studying scripture that every one of those prayers of the saints are stored. And they're, they're stored in, in those prayer bowls in heaven. And they're poured out before God. And those, 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 those prayer bowls, as they are poured out, they, they lift a scent up to God that is pleasing and, and sweet. And it's a sacrifice of the saints that we can give at any point in time. And I thought that was a sweet thing to think about as they said that. And so after that, after that is over, after the angel has, has done his thing with the, uh, with the incense and the prayers, then he takes the coals uh, from the altar and they're thrown down on the earth, and that begins the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the judgment of the seven trumpets. And so let's get into the seven trumpets. Let's see what we're dealing with here uh, because that's a, that's a whole other deal. Again, this is the second, the second series of events that's taken place. Uh, as bad as the first six seals were, uh, these first three or four trumpets are, um, are, are, are worse I mean, everything just gets progressively worse. And, and so here's what we're dealing with in verses 6 through 7. Here's what it says. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. So they all kind of take their position. John's watching all this, and, he, and he's seen these, these seven angels who have emerged from this multitude of people take their position. They get their trumpets ready to blow. And the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. And so what we see here automatically is we, we know that we, from, from trumpet number one, a third of the earth is burned up. Now, what, you're, what we're about to see here is just complete ecological disaster. 
just absolute ecological disaster. A third of the earth is burned up. A third of the trees are burned up. All of the grass is burned up. And then they have this phrase, this uh, mixed with blood, right? And, and what, it, what it says, in fire mixed with blood. And what that indicates is just a lot of people are going to die. There's going to be a lot of people who die as a result of this particular deal. So, again, big ecological d- d- disaster. Um, when we step back and we think about what this looks like, if we kind of put some of the, uh, the meat to it, what it means is that livestock are going to have nothing to graze on. They won't have any, anything that's green on the ground. It's going to be, it's going to be burned up. Livestock will have, have no, nothing to graze on because of the, uh, the trees that have been destroyed and the earth that's been destroyed. There's going to be a lot of uh, chaos as a result of that just to begin with. Keep in mind, again, we don't know how long after uh, the rapture occurs that we, we see the first seals broken. We don't know the time frame as for when it happens, like the rapture takes place. We don't know that the tribulation begins the next day. We don't know if it begins the next hour. We don't know if it begins 50 years from now. We don't know that. All we know is the tribulation lasts seven years. From, so from the time that the white horse comes on, onto the scene to the end of the tribulation, seven years. So we know that sometime in this period of time, all this stuff is going to take place. But what we've got to understand is, so this white horse comes and, and, and the Antichrist is on the scene and he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's doing his thing and getting people to like him and love him and follow him and, and creating peace deals in the Middle East and doing all the things that he's supposed to do and he sets himself up in the temple like we talked about a few weeks ago uh, and he's making himself known in that capacity. All of that is happening and people are still trying to figure out where everybody went, right? Right? And then all of a sudden, all these, these calamities, these, these, these horrible disasters begin to take place all over the world. And, and maybe people realize that this is the tribulation. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just think the world's coming to an end. And they have no idea. And some people are, 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 are in, the, in, in these moments coming to know Christ better. But then all of a sudden, this trumpet sounds, and half, a third of the earth is burned up. All the grass, the third, all the grass is, is, is burned up. All these things begin to take place. And so you take everything that's happened during the, the, uh, the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation, and these, these things will, will snowball. They'll, they'll snowball into climate issues. They'll snowball into food shortages. This will snowball into financial markets that will be affected. I mean, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see financial markets begin to collapse as a result of everything that's taking place here. There'll be a scarcity of resources uh, just on that one trumpet alone. And so everything is just compounded as you continue to kind of build upon everything that, that's taken place so far. Everything just gets compounded. And then if that weren't enough, the second trumpet blows. And we see that in verses 8 through 9. It says, The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. And so the sea becomes blood. A third of the sea, uh, sea life is killed. And a third of the uh, sea vessels are destroyed. Now, keep in mind here, when it says this huge mountain is, is all ablaze, John, again, is writing from a standpoint of his time period and doing his very best to describe what it is that he's seeing. What he's probably seeing here and what he's probably describing here is an asteroid. And so as, as you do a little research, you don't have to Google too many things to figure out that, that an, uh, the impact of an asteroid just a, a half mile wide most scientists believe would have the equivalent power of a million tons of TNT. And so you've got to imagine the kind of impact that that would make wherever it made. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a sonic wave that go, would go along with that that would kill everything in its path for a, a long period, a wide period, a wide scale. Uh, the destruction to the, the, the ecological environment there, the atmosphere in, that, in that, that position, just all kinds of things that would happen as a result of that. Uh, but it wouldn't only affect the, uh, and depending upon where it hit, it might hit in the sea. It might hit outside the sea, but the, uh, it, it would not only affect the atmosphere, but that asteroid's going to affect the sea as well. And the, and the loss of sea life uh, will be great. A third of the sea life will, will be lost. And, and, and then you've got to think about, well, where, where's that dead sea life going? Well, it's just going to float there. I mean, it's going to float to the top, and it's going to begin to decompose. It's going to begin to rot, and it's going to create an awful smell. It's going to contaminate those waters so that nothing else can, 
can can really do well in there. And they'll and it says that the 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 blood of those dead animals will turn a third of the sea, the sea into to blood itself. And so you're gonna you're gonna wind up with a uh, with a really bad situation. And it's again everything compounds on itself. And so this is also gonna contribute to food shortages. It's gonna affect financial markets even further. It will completely devastate villages and towns that uh, that that make their their living solely on the resources of the sea. I mean, there are there are villages and towns that the only reason they exist is because of what they get from the sea and what they're able to sell, if if not to each other, to to different places around the world. Uh, the greatest sources of oxygen in the world come from two different things. They come from trees. But the greatest source, and I don't know how many knew this. I didn't know this until I was studying this. The greatest source of oxygen in the world comes not from trees, but comes from plankton in the ocean. I don't know if anybody knew that or not. I didn't know that until I was studying this. And I checked that out on several different uh, places, and that, and, and, and that was right. And so plankton in the ocean, which is, which is great. So what, you, what you're going to have is now this, this, these, these resources of oxygen are going to take its toll. So we've got the atmosphere that has been just kind of messed up altogether because of all these things that are continuing to compound one another. Uh, it's, it's just going to be a really, really bad situation, and commerce around the world is going to be incredibly devastated uh, because of everything that takes place, and that's just tr- two trumpets in. That's everything from the rapture until the first, from the first seal until the second trumpet. That's where we're at right now. And then we get to the third trumpet in verses 10 through 11. Here's what it says. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch. Again, this is probably an asteroid or a meteor or something along those lines. Fell from the sky on a, on, on a, third, and on, on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitty, bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. bitter. And so at this point... All the fresh water is contaminated, and it's undrinkable. And the earth, the earth atmosphere is affected due to the climate being destroyed from the first and second trumpets. Uh, there will be incredible panic across the world, causing runs on facilities or places that have resources like fresh water or resources like meat of any kind, uh, whether it be fish or or beef, or, or whatever the, the, case, the case may be. Because what's happening at this point is everybody's beginning to get the idea there's something really going wrong. Like, if you haven't figured it out by now, if you didn't know anything about the tribulation, you obviously know that, look, things are, are bleak. And so what happens when things get in, in that kind of mode? It's not going to take much for people to turn inward. It's not going to take much for people to go into a, a self-protection mode. And they're going to do anything that they can to not only protect themselves and their family, but they will rob or kill or do whatever they need to in order to protect their family, in order to get the resources that they might need. And so what's happening here is that people will die and people will make their choices based upon the calamity that's all around them. Some of them will make choices on survival physically. Some of them will make choices on survival spiritually. But people will make choices. And it will be complete chaos, and it will be absolutely incredible what will be taking place. And we haven't even gotten to the, 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 uh, the fourth trumpet, right? And there's three more trumpets after this we won't even get to tonight. But we'll get to the fourth trumpet, and we see this in, chapter 12, or in verse 12. And it says a third of all the light sources are going to be darkened. A third of the sun is going to be hit. A third of the moon. The moon gets its light source from the sun anyway, so the sun's going to be hit. The moon's going to be messed up as well. All the star, a third of the stars are going to be devastated, according to what takes place when the when the fourth angel sounds his trumpet, and the it, it's it, everything is going to be taking place there. Agriculture is going to be disrupted. Day and night cycles are going to be disrupted. You're also going to see the uh, the temperature of the earth will be affected if it hadn't been already because of everything else that was taking place, and all of this will throw further chaos into to what what all's taking place worldwide. And fear will be overpowering, and people will turn to their own most self-protecting mode. I want you to see this in uh, in this fourth trumpet uh, concerning this. Jesus said this about in, in Luke twenty-one, 
chapter, or chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Jesus, the, the, the consistency of Scripture all the way through, to be able to, to see these things, the, the things that Jesus talked about, the things that, that were prophesied, and the, the, all the way from, from, from uh, Genesis to Revelation, how they all connect with one another. I think it's important for us to, to see those things. And then, so that's the first four trumpets. And then we get into uh, to verse 13, and it says, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair. So when it says midair, mid-air here, I want you to picture that, that level of heaven that's just above, you know, as far as we can see. I want you to kind of imagine this. As far as we can see up, you, you see, you've ever seen a rocket as it takes off from, from Cape Canaveral, wherever, wherever it comes from, and it takes off and, it, and, and it's got the camera on it and you see the transition from what we recognize as blue skies and everything else and then it transitions into this dark void of space and you can tell it i want you that that would be the midair point that's where when it, when it talks about midair that's what it's talking about there um he says he says that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth this is a pause this is his angel saying hey look take take a breath because that's just the first four trumpets and the next three trumpets are about to be blown. He says, he says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Now, just to give you something kind of interesting so that you can, you can look at it. And if somebody ever tells you, well, the Bible contradicts yourself, it can't even get your stuff right. Uh, you might, if, you're, if you have a New King James or a King James version of Scripture, when it says, what, what it, when it says the word... Uh, it, it says the word angel instead of the word eagle. I don't know. Does anybody have that? All right. Well, here's, here's, here's the way that you think, well, well, the Bible contradicts itself. It can't even get its, its stuff right. The Greek word that is used here actually means eagle. It actually means eagle. And you say, well, J.J., how does that not contradict itself? Go back in chap- into chapter 4 of Revelation, and I want you to look in verse, uh, well, let's just read the whole thing. Um, in chapter 4. And let's start in um, at the at the uh, in, in verse six. Also, before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature. Now, when we say living creatures here, these are also mean these these, these are angels here. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under his wings, day and night, they never stopped saying and worshiping. And so what you're seeing here is not a discrepancy in Scripture. What you're seeing here is a, is a picture of what John saw. And what he, what he had seen was one of, the, 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 one of these four living creatures that, li- that looked like an eagle. This eagle was flying in midair. And it's telling everybody on earth. It's almost like this, this call to the whole earth. Take a deep breath because that's only four trumpets, right? And so that's what, that's what John is seeing in, in Revelation chapter 8. Everything just gets progressively worse and progressively worse. And it's not going to get any better for a long time. And again, the reason for this is God is doing everything he can to see as many people saved as possible before this, 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 this final battle is fought. And so that's where we're at in chapter 8. We've got a lot coming up in chapter 9. Uh, we start to deal with some more of the demonic in chapter 9. Uh, so if you've not read ahead, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, it'll get very interesting as we continue to go down, go down this road.